I'm pleased to see you all here in person. Uh, we're coming into our last part of the program, which is our policy session. Uh, my name is Buck Moorhead. I'm the chair of New York Passive House. Echoing earlier uh, comments, New York Passive House is grateful for this collaboration with Parsons, School of Constructed Environment, and the Healthy Materials Lab. We also very much appreciate the uh, sponsorship of NYSERDA, not only for this event, but also throughout the Passive House community for many, many years. We are all here on a beautiful fall day, as I'm sure you've noticed, and I'm glad you're not outside at the moment. Uh, happens to be within hours of the autumnal equinox, which is one of those special, you know, 12 hours of night and 12 hours of sun that remind us of our relationship to the sun, its solar ra radiation, which is one of the few inputs we get to the earth, which is effectively a closed system, though from Felix earlier, I learned that there are all these planetary influences hitting the earth, which I had no idea about. So I probably have to adjust that a little bit, but we're effectively a closed system and, and hence the importance of everything you've heard about regenerative design. I mean, that is the crux of what we are talking about today. These systems, ecological systems interrelated to air, water, wildlife, vegetation, pollinators, resources, absent, absent us, these are regenerative. They are circular. We humans have regrettably incorporated what are known as throughput systems or linear systems that uh, basically crash into this beautiful regenerative dance. Our throughput systems are now creating the equivalency of gears gnashing, flows clogging and sputtering with increasing frequency around the globe of these systems. Our responsibility as design professionals, builders, developers, educators, and students is to bring the process and output of our work clearly and strongly into alignment with the Earth's regenerative systems. We have to move aggressively, urgently with respect to operational carbon and passive house, but equally and important, and as you've heard today, arguably more importantly, on dramatically reducing embodied energy and building materials. We want you to go out and spread this world to your clients, uh, this word to your clients, your colleagues, and your projects. It is my pleasure today to introduce our policy roundtable. Uh, our panel members participate in the re regulatory context that directly impacts the implementation of this work we aspire to today. Uh, and as Ed, Ed brought clearly to Gina here, which I was, <laughs> it happened, uh, but I appreciate that uh, that both are here today. Um, they are right at the cutting edge of formulating, incentivizing, and leading us forward in our quest for a zero carbon built environment. Introducing our panel, I will let the bios you have available online give more detail. Leading us off, we will have Mikhail Harametti, uh, who is a carbon fellow with NYSERDA. I think that's technically her title, but Mikhail will correct me if I'm wrong. She will set the stage of what is going on at the New York state level. Mikhail will be followed by Gina Bokra, Dec Director of Sustainability for New York City Department of Buildings. Gina will focus on the implementation of regulations regarding primarily operational carbon. Gina will be followed by Jennifer Leone, the Director of Sustainability for New York City's Housing Preservation and Development. Jen will share her efforts to bring both lower operational carbon and embodied energy requirements into projects managed by HPD. Uh, and Jen will be followed by Beverly Craig of the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. Bev, who will be on Zoom, I I hope it will be on, will appear on Zoom, but hopefully is hearing us. Bev, can you hear us? Yep. Oh, good. Okay, <laughs> very good. Uh, <laughs> Glad to confirm that. Uh, Bev will will share the exciting work our neighbors to the north are achieving, as well as aspirational projects in more nascent phases. During the presentations, if you have any questions for a speaker, please write them down on a file card. 
Uh, you may have picked one up when you entered this space today. If you don't have one, we've got a couple of Passive House members who, George here and uh, Todd, uh, have stacks of cards and even a couple pens. If you want to write questions down, you can pass these out during the presentations if you're writing furiously or you can wait to the end. If you run out of cards, they'll they'll give you extra ones. But they'll be the basis of the Q&A at the end of, uh, so we'll have the presentations, then we'll have kind of an informal panel discussion and then Q&A to follow. Uh, so on that, I, I welcome uh, Mikhail. Thank you, Buck. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Um, I was here last year and um, we had a really amazing, rich conversation and, and it's great to be back and to be able to announce um, many more developments in the space of embodied carbon. So I know that um, there's uh, been a lot shared already on this topic, so I'll, I'll probably move through my um, beginning slides relatively quickly. Um, I'm at NYSERDA. I'm a Carbon Neutral Buildings Fellow. I um, have about 15 years of experience in the building decarbonization space um, and have been working on embodied carbon in New York State for the last couple of years um, and am the embodied carbon um, sort of subject matter expert uh, within the state and, and have a few colleagues who I've been working with to develop those policies. I want to recognize Jody Smith Anderson, who's in the room, and my co author at the um, in developing the um, uh, scoping plan, um, embodied carbon recommendations, which really is the leading policy document for this at the moment. Um, okay, so um, I'll talk a little bit about embodied carbon and, and why it's important. I know others have covered this already in, in more detail. Um, and then I'll go into what's being done in, in New York State um, and talk a little bit about the federal efforts and then what other states are doing. And then I'll wrap up with some examples. So, um, you know, the context here really is that buildings are a significant source of um, emissions globally. Um, about a third of all um, total emissions come from the building sector. And of that, about eight to 11% are from building materials. Um, so this is this is a lot of emissions and, and past efforts have focused primarily on the operational side. Um, and what this means is that th there's actually a lot of low hanging fruit um, on the material side. Um, and, and so I think that there's a real significant opportunity there um, for reduction. And, and you've seen a number of examples of that. But what it means kind of at the macro level is that it's really ripe for policy development. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that that we've been learning as we delve into this at the policy level here in New York is that we just don't have good data on it. So the, you know, this um, graphic, can you guys hear me all right? Okay, good. I, th I thought I heard a speak up. Um, this graphic, um, you know, it is sort of an approximation, right? But, but we're... Um, and it comes from um, the UNEP uh, 2019 report, but we don't have this for New York State. So that's been one of the, the focuses of our, our work in the last year. Um, and there's been a, a lot that's starting to happen at, at, the, um, at the federal level and then also at our um, uh, fellow um, state levels. Um, so, you know, why does this matter? It matters because um, of the time value of carbon. So raise your hand if, you, if you're familiar with the concept of the time value of carbon. Okay, great. Maybe about half half the room. So what what this means is really in order to keep our global emissions to um, within um, one point five degrees um, centigrade, uh, it it means that there's a lot that needs to be done in order to curtail emissions now. And so emissions that are happening um, immediately in the next couple of years are much more impactful at slowing the rate of change and reducing the impact of extreme weather events than emissions reductions in the future. And, and this is really significant because um, for operational emissions, we're looking at, at um, you know, in some cases, sort of relatively small emissions on an annual basis that really add up over time, over 10 or 20 years. But for embodied carbon, all of this stuff is being emitted immediately when these buildings are are constructed and and when um, the the products and the materials are are being manufactured. And so, um, you know, whereas these other ones are are sort of significant over time um, for construction materials, everything that we can do today is going to have a real significant impact on slowing the that rate of of climate change. And it's why after over a decade in the industry, I feel like I, I can't really with good conscience continue to work exclusively on operational emissions reductions, knowing how important um, these um, emissions reductions are on the construction side. So this has really been sort of a personal journey 
journal journey for me over the last couple of years. Um, and it's, it, it um, has been really difficult, I think, you know, sort of even trying to like impress upon my management and others the importance of it. And, and I feel like I've, I've had to become a little bit of an evangelist for it um, within within my agency and within the state because of, of this real urgency and and the um, impact um, that is possible to make on, on um, global emissions reductions, but also, um, you know, on emissions reductions within the state. Um, and then the other thing, you know, to mention is is that um, I think part of the kind of difficulty in the policy landscape is that, that these emissions um, have not necessarily been counted in our New York State or um, U.S. Um, emissions inventories. And so when we're thinking about emissions that sort of like qualify um, for like credit for being reduced, often um, embodied carbon emissions are not part of that group. And um, so what's needed is to really pull that into the fold and, and think of the total emissions that can be reduced and, and um, ensure that the um, embodied carbon emissions are counted along with operational emissions reductions. Okay, um, so you've heard a little bit about this, I think already today, how it can be reduced. These are, this is kind of the way I conceive of the categories. Um, you know, one, one is on the um, industrial side, um, doing things like um, electrifying um, uh, uh, factories and um, blast furnaces, right? Increasing the efficiency of the industrial sector overall. Um, also electrifying um, equipment at the construction site. Um, which I think is a little self self-explanatory. Um, I, I think a lot of the um, uh, strategies that we've seen today have focused on product um, substitutions. Um, you you know using a less um, carbon intensive product for a high carbon intensive one, like substituting spray foam um, insulation for a bio based insulation. Um, also doing things like using um, less of that higher intensity material. Um, so in this example, um, concrete um, going with a waffle design instead of a, a slab um, and, and also really focusing on reusing existing materials and, and buildings instead of tearing something down, looking at maybe doing a, a gut retrofit or seeing if there are materials on site that, that um, can be harvested and reused and incorporated into the new project. So um, I don't know, was this shown in, a, in an earlier slide? I, I um, missed some of the, the earlier ones. So, okay, good. Um, so this, what this shows is the, the building life cycle. Um, and so this is kind of the standard way that um, projects are um, assessed and their, their co component um, parts um, are looked at as part of the whole building life cycle analysis, a whole building LCA. And this really covers the project from, from start to finish, from the mining um, of the products that go into a, a project or building to their eventual disposal. Um, and so each of these phases has uh, a number associated with it. You can see operations um, is B1 through B7. Um, and a lot of the, the documentation that we have, which I'll talk about in a minute, is on the building, um, uh, is on the product stage, um, which is what's called cradle to gate. That's the one with a little green box around it, A1 through A3. And most of the emissions happen at this phase. And so it's, you know, why it's particularly important um, to have good data on that phase. Um, and then um, this is an example of um, an LCA tool. So the LCA um, tools are, are software uh, tools that model the um, total emissions for a project. Um, and it lets us um, determine, you know, where each of at each of the stages where the emissions um, are um, added to the project or Im embedded in that project. Um, so for a window, for instance, um, it would be like the uh, emissions from the window factory divided by the number of windows um, that are made at that factory per year, um, plus the respective share of emissions from the mining of like the silica and the aluminum and the other raw materials that go into creating that window, uh, transporting it to the factory and then shipping it to the client site, installing it, and then the end of life disposal. So that's sort of how you would figure out the LCA for that particular product. Um, and there are a number of tools for cal calculating um, the LCA, the life cycle assessment for, for a project. And so I've listed a few of them and and um, these tools typically rely on an LCA library um, for standard values like emissions factors, and they're governed by international by uh, ISO standards and um, product category rules and and um, use the specifics of the region that they're in. So, for instance, this would be using using the North American region um, standards. 
So this is an environmental product declaration. I know that they've been referenced a couple times already today. Um, raise your hand if you've seen one of these already. Okay, so this, this group is pretty familiar. Um, we, we refer to it as a nutrition label for building materials. Um, and uh, it um, shows the ingredients and um, you know that that's really the materials that go into that product um, and the applicable um, uh, rules that go into the calculation of the numbers that are on um, this environmental product declaration. And then sort of most importantly for us, it has the global warming potential, um, which is the one that's in that green box. Um, Okay, so now I'm going to go into um, some of our, our local policies, and I, I apologize if this is a little bit fast. There's a, a lot to cover, um, and I'm happy to, to describe the details um, during the break, too. So um, I'm going to start with Executive Order 22, which was in, issued in September of last year. Um, and this is really the first um, substantive policy directive that focused on embodied carbon. Um, it came out the same time as the federal buy clean um, requirements. And um, the focus is on New York state procurement and it requires um, uh, collecting EPDs where possible um, and also for the design teams to calculate um, uh, uh, project-based um, emissions. So the first round of this guidance came out in June of this year. Um, and then um, that's sort of been focusing on reporting. Um, this is the... What, what that guidance contains. Um, and we're gonna be issuing another round next year. So this applies to state projects over a million dollars um, signed after October of this year. And this is really a, a reporting framework. And um, you know I think what, what's pretty important and unique about it is that we've identified what the high carbon intensity materials are for reporting um, in the state of New York. So these are uh, concrete, asphalt, steel, and glass. Um, and um, we have reporting by the state agencies starting in August of 2024, um, and, this, and the individual contracting agencies um, will need to start including the contract language um, in the fall of this year, and they may have sort of initial, an, an initial um, reporting requirements of their own um, that are more specific than this. So this is really kind of setting the floor. Um, so for those of you who are working on state agency projects, you, you might you might learn that there's like a little bit more detail in this. Um, okay, and then the, the next thing, this is our, our big announcement this week. Um, this is the New York State Bike Clean Concrete Guidance. So it came out in on Tuesday of this year. Um, and this is the, the first time we have publicly um, uh, shown information about it. So you guys are are the first. It was a governor's announcement on, on Tuesday of this week, and we got a, a really nice article in Bloomberg yesterday and a few other publications. So um, if you're looking for the details, you, you should just be able to um, Google New York State Bike Lane Concrete Guidance and um, pull up some of those articles. But this is, this is the meat of it. Um, and so this makes um, New York State the first in the nation to adopt mandatory um, concrete emission limits for all of its agencies. Um, for applicable projects. So the applicable projects um, are um, over a million dollars um, for state agencies, for most state agencies, and over three million for transportation projects. And um, what this is requiring is EPDs um, to be submitted with all concrete mixes starting in January 1st of 2025 and compliance with these um, emissions, emissions requirements uh, starting in 2025 as well. And so, um, we have a, a, about a year and a half um, to work with the concrete industry in the state of New York um, to get them outfitted to be producing EPDs, um, which we know is going to be a pretty significant lift. And so NYSERDA will also be um, developing uh, technical assistance offering uh, to help help those um, plants. And we know um, the EPA also earlier this week actually announced that they're going to have funding available for concrete manufacturers um, for EPD production. So that's that's pretty exciting. But I think the release of this guidance is, is just kind of the, the beginning um, of the work that, that's needed to really um, bring our concrete industry along in, in New York. And we've had a lot of conversations with the concrete industry and um, our goal is to, to transform um, the way concrete is produced in New York and to add transparency to it and to do that with a, as high a percentage of the industry as possible, um, rather than, you know, just sort of working with a few select um, high, high achiever 
um, producers. So we, we you know, we, we want to um, not leave, a, you know, a considerable portion of them behind, which I think is kind of the thing that would happen if we're, if we're not engaging. Um, okay. Um, so key difference between the two, um, I might, I might skip, skip over this to some degree, but essentially our guidance on Tuesday is for concrete only. It's for one product. Um, and it applies just to New York state agencies because that's how the, the law was written. Um, and the, um, the EO 22 guidance from June is for agencies and authorities and is much broader and kind of governs total projects, um, including the design and the quantity used of that, um, material. There's also no re, uh, reporting requirement with our bike lane concrete limits. It, it literally just is limits um, and all the reporting will happen under executive order 22. Um, okay, so I just want to want to note also that we do have a Green New York um, low, lower carbon concrete spec out there. Um, also um, co-written co and, and birthed, I guess, by, by Jody when she was a, um, a civil servant at, at the state. Um, and we'll be revising this um, probably next year to, to have it be more of a focus on um, uh, performance. So it's more of a, a performance specification. Right now it's a little bit of an amalgam and it has a lot of suggestions for um, uh, methods for reducing the um, carbon intensity of concrete. Um, just also to kind of overview to touch on the fact that um, New York State has an executive order of its own. Um, I don't want to steal the thunder of my fellow presenters, so um, you'll hear more about that shortly. Um, and and then really, you know, this is sort of the reigning policy document that we have, which is the um, the Climate Action Council scoping plan. It, it was adopted in um, December of this last year. Really, one of the best documents that I've worked on in my career. Like in, incredibly detailed and powerful. And um, if if you haven't read it, I encourage you to do so. There's a link to it at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and we were able to get embodied carbon recommendations in three separate chapters. So the bulk of it is in the buildings chapter, but also um, you know substantive recommendations in the industrial chapter and the waste chapter. Um, uh, a lot of um, programmatic efforts going on um, that are kind of working on, on the sides to incorporate embodied carbon. Build, nicer to Buildings of Excellence program is probably the most noteworthy one. It was mentioned by Edward, our uh, previous presenter. And, and I think what's really important here is that embodied carbon is part of the scoring criteria now. It's, it's been incorporated in the second, third, and uh, recently released fourth round. Um, and so this means that we have example projects in New York that we have really good information on and, and can highlight. And I think that that's really critical for getting the word out and showing how it's possible. Uh, we also have a number of sustainable design guidelines in the state that include embodied carbon. Um, and then there's been a lot going on at the federal level. And I, I, I know I'm short on time. And so um, I, I'm happy to, to chat more about this, but um, a lot of money in the um, Inflation Reduction Act, a lot of work being done at the EPA. As I mentioned earlier, they just released um, a, an announcement saying that they'll be funding for um, environmental product declaration development. Um, so they're working on uh, methodology. They had an RFI that was due in May and, and we'll be coming out with a program announcement this fall um, showing exactly what funding will be, will be available and, and working on labeling. So there's a, a lot coming out there. And then also at the GSA um, in, in um, May also, they um, announced um, limits for pilots that are being funded by the IRA. And so they've been working with the EPA to figure out kind of what are the priority materials to focus on in the short term. And they actually have a list of like kind of first tier, second tier, tier and third tier materials. Um, and you know how to identify um, what, what those um, limits should be and um, you know when they should apply, and so the, they're actually using a um, EPA determination that was made in December um, to help guide their programs. And then there's also been a lot um, being done on the transportation side through the Federal Highway Administration, and they're giving out grants for the incremental cost of using low embodied carbon materials um, and funding pilot projects. And then DOE also has ongoing work. So I'm gonna I'm. I'm just going to speed through these. These are some of the the limits from um, the May pilots by the released by the GSA. You'll see that they've focused on the same materials that we're focusing on here in New York: um, concrete, asphalt, steel, and glass. They have a slightly different approach than we're using. They're using this sort of top tier of uh, 20% because they recognize that this is an emerging market and 
there's a lot um, that's changing rapidly in New York for concrete. We thought it was really important to have um, clear numbers that aren't going to change over the next couple of years. And so we, we decided to just set um, kind of firm limits. And, and that's why we included published limits rather than this kind of um, more interim approach. Um, and I also want to mention there's been a lot happening at the different states. So California led the way with its bike lane legislation, I guess, almost 10 years ago. And, and um, this year, they're actually going to be adopting um, embodied carbon into their state building code, um, which is pretty impressive. They haven't been able to make much progress on concrete, unfortunately. The concrete lobby has been pretty effective there. Um, but a lot is being done in, in um, Colorado. They passed uh, low carbon concrete and, and bike lane guidance about the same time as New York and have really taken off development um, of programs at the State Department of Transportation and the State Architect. And they have a lot of excellent information online. So if you're looking for guidance, I think Colorado is probably the best source to go to. Um, uh, Oregon um, also, um, it has been kind of noodling on it, as has Washington. Um, New Jersey um, passed low carbon concrete um, a year after New York and um, has some tax credits that are pretty interesting, but are still on the development side. Um, and then Minnesota, um, their uh, Department of Transportation has been doing a lot with experimentation of low carbon concrete and actually have a test center called Min Roads where they can divert traffic onto this test roadway. Um, and um, use different types of materials there without sort of affecting the flow of traffic. Um, so a, a lot a lot is happening right now, and I think that we're kind of you know right in line with all of it. Um, very quickly, some case studies in New York. Um, this is a Buildings of Excellence project, Solera Phase Three, three up in Rotterdam. Um, and so this is, a, I think, a great example of a, a project where um, while they were in the design phase, you know, they were like pretty far along, they um, then took a step back and tried to figure out how they can reduce embodied carbon and were, were pretty effective at it. They um, actually reduced the embodied carbon of the building envelope by 65%, um, really just through uh, product substitution. And this is um, a zero zero net energy project, and and I think it it shows that you can do it, you know, even if a project is pretty far along. Um, the Jones Beach Nature Center, you know, great example of of net zero and mass timber. I think you've heard about mass timber a lot today, and and that's an area that I think is really encouraging, and 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 you know is is being used for its aesthetic properties, also, which is really encouraging because I think it that there's like some natural market adoption that is happening there that's maybe you know not the case for um, bio based insulation or you know some of the like ones that you interact with less, um, and then I. Finally, I want to end with Decalb Commons. Um, this is one of Sarah's projects, and it's how I really got to know and, and be impressed by the, the breadth of her experience on this. This is also a, a nicer to Buildings of Excellence award winner. Um, and, um, you know, her, her firm did a lot um, with uh, the design side and um, LCA tools to, to identify where there were opportunities for reduction in, in embodied carbon, and particularly the trade off between embodied carbon and operational carbon. Um, and um, found some kind of interesting things like using R30 insulation, um, I think for the roof, right, was preferable to R50. Um, and they found that they could ask their concrete supplier to produce low carbon concrete um, and that that was really impactful and it just like wasn't even an option. So they, they didn't know until they asked and it sounds like it was with little inc incremental cost. Um, and then they were able to use other materials um, uh, like the the uh, rain screen with insulation in place of e exterior cladding. So just kind of looking at it and, and playing with the numbers, um, we're, we're able to make some really substantive design, design changes. So I'm going to end with that. I know that, that that was a lot and it was long, but happy to chat more about the details. Hello, everybody. I'm Gina Boker. Thanks to my friend, Ed. You already know that. I don't know where it went. <laughs> um, it's really great to be here. So thank you for the invitation to join you. Um, I'm going to blow you away with some slides now. Um, if I figure out how to advance this. So um, I'm an architect, uh, chief sustainability officer at the Department of Buildings. This is my whole presentation. So don't fall out of your chair. I do all my work in words. Um, so that you can take those and translate them into amazing buildings. And um, 
I'm grateful to be here today to talk about the work that we're doing on carbon at the city, which is mostly still in operational carbon, but it's still really important. Um, and hopefully everybody in this room, aside from what Ed just shared with you about Local on 97, has heard of it. Is there anyone that's not very familiar with what Local on 97 is all about? Nobody's raising their hand. So, great. Uh, the city's carbon uh, uh, reduction law um, passed as part of the Climate Mobilization Act. We are within months of the first year uh, that owners have to be coming into compliance with that law. I wanted to let everybody know that we have uh, recently issued our second set of rulemaking, which is what has consumed most of our time over this past year. We set our first set of rules out at the end of last year mainly to provide clarity and help owners understand how they would have um, to report certain things to us. Um, and uh, this next set of rulemaking uh, covers a couple of really important things um, that I think hopefully brought a little bit of relief to owners, but also is motiva motivating those owners that haven't gotten started. So in our recent set of rules that we issued at the end of the summer, just a few weeks ago, um, I guess, end of summer today, right, Buck? Um, so we, we made it within our summer timeline. Um, we've issued the guidance on the policy frame or uh, penalty framework. Everybody's really concerned about penalties. That's really what we hear from owners about most of the time. And in that penalty framework, we talk about what an owner can do to mediate their penalties if they haven't met their, their limits, which is something that we had to do by the law. It's in the law. And in the law, it also calls out what a good faith effort is. So if an owner comes to us and, and they show and demonstrate a good faith effort in meeting the, guide, uh, the, the limits, then uh, we can talk to them about reducing their penalty. And that's important because we want them to take their money and invest it in their building instead of paying fines. And so that's a really important uh, part of the rules that we hope everybody can take a little time to get familiar with. If they come to us and they say, I'm really working on this, they have another two years to meet their 2024 limit. But it's very important to recognize that in addition to that, they have to come to us with a decarbonization plan for their building that looks all the way out to full compliance with that 2050 target. So that's not a small undertaking. It also means that they have to have the work started on everything that they have to do to comply with their 2030 limit. And if they haven't done those things, they're subject to back penalties as if they never started through that process. So this doesn't reward an owner that's not going to do anything. It's really to help those owners who are trying and are, are really implementing the, the things that they need to be doing. Another one that's really exciting is uh, a credit for beneficial electrification. So we're talking about time value of carbon again here. Um, Mikhail, where'd you go? <laughs> Back there, time value of carbon um, in this rule. And it's about the only way that we can incentivize anything for owners because we have very limited ability to provide incentives at the city level. So the uh, beneficial electrification credit rewards owners for carbon savings as if the grid were clean already, which it's gonna take a little while to catch up, but we want them to electrify their buildings now. And um, in, in addition to giving them credit for installing equipment like heat pumps and, and other electric equipment that will be really great when we have a clean grid. Um, we allow them to apply those credits to either the 2024 to 2029 period or to the 2030 to 2034, because almost 90% of buildings comply with the 2024 limits now. So that's the other really great news is that directionally we are seeing a shift and the law was designed to penalize the top 20% worst buildings in the city. So we're, we've taken that 20% and it's down to 11 already. So that's really great news. Um, and then um, lastly, the rules cover what is required for those rent regulated houses of worship properties that are under article 321. Hopefully I'm not getting too wonky here. Um, they either have to meet the 2030 limit, which sounds crazy to some people, 
or they do a set of prescriptive energy conservation measures. And the rule outlines what's required for those energy conservation measures, so owners can make sure that they're done with those by the end of next year. But I do want to go back to this 2030 target. Almost 20% of those properties comply with their 2030 emissions today. And so that's a really easy pathway for that owner to work with their registered design professional, document where how they're performing now, and they can ignore all those PECMs and, and just keep working on operating their building well. Um, there's also a rule for local I-88, which is the requirement to upgrade lighting and provide submetering throughout your building. So, but that's not exciting, right? <laughs> um, hopefully owners have been doing that work to, and it, it's really important that they've done that work to comply with local I-97 where they have much bigger fines. So that's an update on our rulemaking at the department, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to share that with you. Um, there's a hearing on October 24th if you want to come and support what we've done or come and, and challenge what we've done and help us improve it. Um, Ed keeps stealing my thunder. I also wanted to talk to you about Local Law 154, which is our electrification law. Has everybody in this room heard of it? A couple people shaking their heads no. So um, I think Ed talked about this a little bit, that we have um, Local Law 154 is New York City's electrification law. And these laws have been challenged across the United States. So we're really happy with the approach that we've taken because we didn't ban natural gas outright. We have set a limit on how much fossil fuel combustion can happen in new buildings. And that also applies to natural gas stoves. So Local Law 154, starts on January 1st this coming year. And that applies to all R3 buildings. So one, two family homes cannot have gas powered equipment anymore after January 1st. And it also applies to buildings under seven stories with the exception of service hot water. And so for a few more years, you can still do um, fossil fuel powered equipment for service hot water. And as Ed mentioned, over time, we change these requirements and by 2027, we will have no more fossil fuel based equipment in new buildings with the exception of certain types of systems or certain types of spaces. Unfortunately, we passed our legislation, we could not get support for commercial kitchens to be fossil fuel free. <laughs> and so I'm hopeful that maybe over time we can see enough restaurants really get behind induction cooking and we can maybe uh, eliminate it for commercial kitchens in the in the future as well. Um, so, I, and I just want to touch base on this, uh, you know, embodied carbon and how it relates to local I ninety seven. Obviously, this is fifty thousand buildings that we're talking about under local I ninety seven. They are about sixty percent of our building um, sector emissions without taking into account embodied carbon for new construction. But to put it into context, new construction pre-COVID is about 2,000 new buildings a year in New York City. And of the 2,000 new buildings, about a quarter of them are one to two family homes. So when you compare the two, our operational carbon problem is still enormous. And we also need to ensure that we're taking those 50,000 buildings and we are extending the life and extending the, the, the value of the carbon that's already been invested in those properties. So making sure that they don't become obsolete. So there is a, and you know, an intersection there between the operational carbon and the local law 97 and the embodied. And then I want to transition to what we are doing on embodied carbon. And it looks like somebody talked about timber framing earlier today and mass timber. I'm excited that there were changes in the 2022 code. If you're not aware of them, hopefully they recovered earlier today. No, no. <laughs> All right. So um, the 2022 building code has enabled the use of timber framing. Um, of course, there are lots of uh, uh, code provisions that you should check out. Um, this is a very densely populated and densely built city. So just the same as we're talking about energy storage systems, raise a lot of red flags for my friends at FDNY. Uh, timber framing also raised a lot of red flags for our friends at FDNY. And so we have an adopted set of provisions that allow um, 
cross laminated uh, timber structural composite lumber to be used for type four construction. And um, that's super exciting for me. It is based on the height limits of the 2015 IBC. So yeah, there are other jurisdictions that have gone farther. That's that's great. It's um, it's a challenge in New York City because we need non-combustible construction for a reason. But um, I do want to make everybody aware there was a really great presentation from my colleague on timber framing last year at our uh, Build Safe, Live Safe conference. And that presentation is still on our website. So you can go to our website. It goes into all of the detail on the code provisions that regulate um, mass timber construction. And it applies to a lot of those new construction applications that we see every year, which is about 50 to 60% low to mid-rise multifamily buildings. And so very applicable. Um, take a look at that presentation by Keith Wynn. And um, I also just wanna do a shout out to um, New York City uh, EDC because this week they launched a mass timber studio and they're gonna spend about the next nine to 12 months looking at how that technology and that kind of approach on structural systems will work for New York City and, and whether we can do more. So I hope everybody takes a look at that. That's really great. And then as um, we're seeing this evolution in embodied carbon, uh, generation of more data, um, other jurisdictions uh, beginning to set targets and sometimes limits, um, this has definitely come up. Um, I was looking for a, per a, a particular advisory board member from Local on 97 who's in the Passive House community. Maybe you guys know. Uh, this came up at our second meeting in Local on 97 advisory board. Of course, we're all concerned about uh, embodied carbon and we can do more. And so the department um, is looking at what kind of policy approaches we could take. And uh, these are really great ideas. We've talked to a lot of stakeholders. We've gotten really great input from the, the um, Concrete Industry Board, who's also excited about what we can do on embodied carbon. And uh, there will be more to come. So keep watch. Thank you. All right, can you hear me? All right, happy Climate Week. This is a great way to end things. We really started, I really started talking about operational carbon on Monday. Here we are, embodied carbon on Friday. So great. Um, let's see, I'm going to see if I can go in the right direction. Yes. Uh, my name is Jen Leone. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. So we're an implementing agency in New York City. We build stuff. We don't technically build it, we finance it. And what we do is we finance more than 16,000 units of affordable housing across the five boroughs each year. So it's a lot. It's a good piece of preservation. So already the embodied carbon issue, I don't have to talk about that. And we also do a lot of new construction. Um, this is just a map of what it is we're doing. We have pretty rigorous design guidelines and a sustainability framework for all of the work we do. Um, we, as you can see, I'm not going to go in detail, but our work is generally covered by design guidelines that we create. Our design guidelines have to make sure that our buildings meet all the city's laws, all the city's codes. You've heard about some of them earlier today, but luckily we are able to go well above and beyond what our peers are doing. We integrate all the stuff that has to be done. And then we try and think through what can we do? How can we do better for affordable housing? And why? Because we pay for it, we subsidize it, and we're able to go above and beyond. So I'm gonna try and move really quickly through this. A couple of things we do and how we get to the above and beyond on our projects. Um, we have a really good RFP process for sites on, on public sites, projects on public sites. And we've always been able to engage innovation. We ask for more on projects where the land is free. These are a couple of example RFPs. I guess I can hear myself a lot better this way that we've done in the past. We had a passive house RFP, sustain RFP, sustain NYC. 
um, a shared uh, living model. We have uh, resiliency RFPs, modular RFPs. And this is where we're able to see all of these cool, innovative approaches that the design community wants to take on affordable housing. And so we finance it, we build it, we have all of the evidence to see what's going to happen next. And the Sustain YC RFP has gotten and triggered a lot of passive house activity in New York City. So that's pretty cool. We also have a lot of pilot programs. We get funding, a lot of funding from NYSERDA and other sources. We launch pilots so that we can go not just put in our guidelines what we want to see, but to pay for it, build capacity around it, and make sure that buildings are able to do cool stuff. This is our solar or feasible program. Really sounds not that cool, but we're affordable housing. We can't look like we're spending a lot of money. Um, but our when the city set local laws 92 and 94 requiring solar on new roofs, somehow the law said affordable housing only to the extent feasible as determined by my agency HPD. So when that law rolled out, which I had nothing to do with, we're like, how are we going to determine what's feasible, A, and B, everybody's going to say, HPD won't pay for this, solar's not feasible, we want a waiver. And we're like, that's kind of stupid, right? Like, let's kick off a program and we can figure out what's feasible. And more than that, we can figure out how to teach people how great solar is and how feasible it almost always is on projects. Since 2020, we've built um, 12 megawatts of cost-effective solar, and we've really changed, I think, the tone of how solar gets built in affordable housing. People just come up to us saying, you know, we've got solar, we want to do solar, and even the most resistant and conservative financing entities are asking, where's the solar? So that's, you know, another thing that we're doing that is carbon-related and so on. Oops, let's see if I can get this. Couple other interesting pilots. We launched a retrofit electrification pilot. Again, NYSERDA funding. We are building electrification in these old existing New York City buildings. And I can tell you, if you've not tried to do it, it's really, really hard, right? These are affordable housing projects, a lot of issues, a lot of complexities. We're experimenting with a lot of different technologies for electrification of heat and hot water always, of course, paired with efficiency and so on. And we've got, um, our goal is about 1,500 affordable housing dwelling units. Um, we've got four closed, meaning financed already, um, eight projects in 17 buildings. Um, we, they're already approved, they're in our pipeline, and a whole queue of other projects waiting for funding. So that's pretty cool. We're providing technical assistance. We're trying to make sure this is electrification done well. Some people in this room may have projects on the screen. Top left, just a clue. That's from uh, Sarah's firm, super cool. Just wanna shout out there. Um, we just launched, launched our future housing initiative, $15 million to fund passive house all electric construction in our new construction pipeline. I could call out some other people in the room. Ed, for one, had some pretty in innovative approaches for low carbon um, heat pumps on uh, at least two of the applications, if not more. Um, and we selected eight, eight buildings to receive this funding, and we, we will monitor and track these over their lifetime. But that's the stuff we've always been talking about. And sorry for my typo. This is beyond operational carbon. I just wanted to talk for a few minutes on what we're doing on that front. Um, it's interesting for me, looking back a couple years, which was a really long time ago because of COVID. Um, and I look back at what we were trying to think about in 2022. We have this cool roadmap for how we're going to decarbonize our new construction, our preservation, our existing buildings, and then the, the buildings that we hold in our asset managed portfolio. And you can see some of the key terms here, scale up electrification, incentivize all electric, mandate electrification across the different pieces of our portfolio. But even in 2022, we weren't just thinking about operational carbon. Our roadmap included climate resiliency and safer, better material pallets, for lack of a better term. So we're not just thinking of embodied carbon, of course, we're thinking of material safety and health, but it's all tied together. Um, 
And a couple of things we thought of is by 2020, 24 and 2025, we'd start to roll out some new standards at that point. Um, this is, of course, in addition to enhanced climate resiliency. So all of this was in our mindset as we're working through our future plans. And I mentioned, uh, oh, sorry, let me not jump too far ahead of myself. Also back in 2022, we put together a workshop beyond operational carbon. This got together a bunch of folks from the AIA and from our sister agencies and other communities to talk about how are we gonna get there with the um, embodied carbon issue, right? What do, what do we need to be doing? How do we get the conversation started? It's really hard. We had no laws in place to really set the tone. Um, and what did we do? A lot of people talked, we put together a Miro board, we put a lot of stickies on for what do we need to be doing now? What do we need to be doing by 2030? And I'm not gonna talk about the things, a lot of them look pretty familiar. Um, two years later, almost, it's now whatever, late 2023, we just announced our new construction design guideline updates. Now, you saw the diagram way before, all of our projects are subject to design guidelines, that's our existing buildings and everything else. But we were able to embed a ton of this, you know, fast forward, future proof construction. Um, we have all electric building requirement ahead of local law 154. We have um, <clears throat> resiliency. All of our buildings that are starting construction need to be designed to future flooding, sea level rise and stormwater requirements. And we snuck in some low carbon standards for concrete and steel also. Now, I don't do this myself. I leverage other laws, right? Uh, I think Mikhail talked about uh, executive, excuse me, executive order 23, which requires um, certain uh, carbon and steel specifications, but that is for city buildings. We're not a city, we don't do city owned buildings, right? So for us, Voluntary standard, we've made it mandatory for what we're doing. Um, those are our baseline criteria. We have a few reach criteria, um, meaning the things we want people to do that have value but aren't required. What I'm super proud is when I went back and looked at the Miro board, if you look at my little key, anything in blue is now actually mandatory in our design guidelines, right? Anything green is referenced and everything else is maybe a next step. But it's just kind of, you know, important to note, Ed pointed it out, our stakeholder input and insight is really important for setting policies. I don't make the rules and laws like Gina does, but we make our own policies. And if we find that there's enough appetite and ability to get this stuff to happen, we can do that in our work. Couple things, I'm not gonna talk about these at length, but you can read on the screen a couple of our mandatory and reach requirements around materials. We also focus on water resiliency, material health, and so on. But just so everybody can see sort of directionally where we're going um, with embodied carbon. We release design guidelines every three years. So, you know, in three more years, there'll be more, you know, ambitious requirements. Um, last thing I'll say, because it's fun to end with this, um, we're continuing to do RFPs on the few remaining public sites in New York City. We have not done one um, for, for mass timber. We haven't done the food waste to food, you know, recycling projects and all the fantasy cool stuff we'd like to have. But what is happening is all of these things are sneaking into the applications by the more forward thinking applicants. This is an old um, RFP, big ideas for small lots, and three out of eight, um, what do you call it, sub winners, I can't, I'm not remembering my words right now, were already um, proposing mass timber. Now, none of these have gotten built to date, but another recent RFP we had, again, this kind of cool innovation related to embodied carbon is showing up, and people know if they want to get and be awarded these projects, they have to be more innovative and get further or else they're not even going to be considered for our funding. Passive house, by the way, is sort of like baseline in our RFPs now. Um, next step, I'm th I think we'll talk about some of this, but the biggest message that I've learned working for the city is 
you got to always think like now low hanging fruit and the 10 year goal, because it takes 10 years to get to the big goals and you have to start doing the things now and getting the data now and setting the framework now. So that in 10 years, you're ready to do the thing. That's it. Um, thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, what an honor to be asked to come from up north in Massachusetts to come talk to you guys who have so many incredible cool things going on. I've got to say, what a symposium, great materials, MEP, all these policies. I'm learning a ton. Um, but um, can you, who's going to be advancing the slides? Uh, uh, Buck will be. Okay. You're in, that's not a great, great sign though. <laughs> Could you advance, Buck? Got the, I've got the right button with my finger on it. Should I do it right now? Yeah, go ahead. Wrong button. <laughs> oh, this well, at first I was so excited to come meet all of you. And unfortunately COVID finally caught up with me last weekend. So, uh, but th thanks so much for having me. Um, I wanted to, uh, what I want to talk a little bit about is some policies related to operational carbon in Massachusetts around Passive House, especially in the multifamily space, uh, where we've seen some lessons, and then some just very early low embodied carbon uh, kinds of voluntary initiatives, uh, where we're really trying to tease out uh, high impact, low cost kinds of measures. Can you advance again, Buck? Great. Um, so on the slide before, the, there was a picture of the first Passive House multifamily building in Massachusetts, the distillery. It was 28 units. It was built in 2016. So one multifamily Passive House in Massachusetts in 2016. Today, we have 198 buildings going for Passive House, over 13,000 units. Um, that's about a quarter of the new construction market that's underway right now. And I would expect within the next two years, about half will be going for Passive House. Uh, so that's just like a huge change in a very short period of time. Next slide. So how did we do it? Um, the first thing was really, I think most people were concerned the costs were going to be 10, 15% premium, and it was going to be too expensive. Uh, so dispelling misperceptions about cost was our first thing then offering a very understandable utility incentive to incentivize Passive House, customizing Passive House educational resources. And then finally, this big jump that we're gonna see between now and a couple years is because we're really bringing up the baseline of energy code so that it's really required for an awful lot of the buildings in Massachusetts. Next slide. So as I said, like this was a, our big concern in 2016. People were like, what? It's way too expensive. So next slide. And so um, my agency, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, what we did was just a small pilot of eight buildings, of all affordable housing, where we gave a $4,000 per unit incentive for them to upgrade plans. So this is low-income housing tax credit, right? They, probably are at 80% drawings already. So it's fairly easy to track the changes from what they bid the first time to later and to just really track the costs very closely. So 540 units, um, six of those are complete and two are almost done now. Next slide. And on average, 2.4% uh, incremental cost. So it does range a little, and we learned some things about what was more expensive, what was least expensive. I think the most important thing is basically the, the more educated the team was, the least expensive it was. Uh, there definitely was the more complex that the roof lines were, the more expensive it was. And then um, one of the higher costs across all of them was ventilation, better ventilation. And I just think it's not that hard really to sell better ventilation in COVID and wildfire kinds of situations anymore. Um, and so all this information is on MassCEC's webpage. We have a great ACEEE paper, if you're interested, that we can send around as follow-up. Next slide. 
So nine months after MassEC's pilot program launched, um, the Mass Save program, which is the big utility money, so think of like 90% of NYSERDA like is the Mass Save program, but it's run by the utilities. They basically took uh, the same framework of our $4,000 per unit one and created a $3,000 one. And it's ongoing, it's predictable for three years. They just renewed it for another three years and it's $3,000 per unit. So it's not one of these utility programs where it's like an MMBTU saved kind of thing that you usually see from a utility. It's really predictable for owners. And um, it also funds passive house feasibility studies upfront, modeling upfront. Uh, both of those are super helpful. Next slide. And then education, just, I, I think NYSERDA was uh, funding and maybe they still do in New York, um, half the cost of getting a passive house, you know, certified passive house consultant or builder or tradesperson. Um, MassSave has been doing that. And so the number of professionals in Massachusetts has exploded, which is super important. Um, passive house Massachusetts does a ton of education. We also customize things like from Passive House Accelerators, Video Library, FIAS Workshops, PHI Workshops. Next slide. And then finally, like what's really gonna take it to the next level is people were getting enough com comfortable enough that the costs weren't off the chart and they were comfortable enough that um, they could find people who knew what they were doing that a number of communities chose to require it in the specialized um, opt-in net zero code. So 20 communities in Massachusetts have now voluntarily picked that up and that requires passive house for multifamily over 20,000 square feet. And to give you some perspective, that's more than 20% of the population and more communities continue to add on to that. Next slide. So that's sort of the, the, the operational, and of course that's new construction, which is, is the really easy part of building operational energy, uh, but it's still sort of remarkable that we've been able to come so far so quickly. Um, embodied carbon, we're just starting to explore what to do. And actually I hear, you know, there's a number of states that are trying to, that are doing, including New York, uh, it sounds like, doing um, buy clean concrete, uh, laws. And so far, our state legislature has not passed one of those. They are considering one of those. But in the meantime, um, my agency, Mass CEC, decided to help uh, provide small grants to the 63 uh, ready mix concrete producers in the state to get set up with the software to do instant EPDs for every mix that they have that's third party verified and uh, plant specific. It's not it's short, short money. This program is like $250,000. Uh, we are working very closely with the trade association for um, the ready mix producers in Massachusetts. And they're the ones who rolled it out. Um, we went from about 20 EPDs to over 300 in two months. Uh, and we have about a third of the ready mix producers uh, signed up and already asking for reimbursement under this program. I, I would be very surprised if less than about 75% of all ready mix producers in the state don't take this care of it because they see that they're going to be sticks coming, but it's really helpful to have the carrot at the same time because it's just going to move us so much faster. So what this means is right now, architects in Massachusetts and structural engineers can ask um, for what mix they would normally give you, ask for an EPD for that, then ask for, hey, what would the better a better uh, lower carbon concrete um, EPD and mix be and what the cost difference is for that? And then like, what would be the best you could do? And so you can see sort of already the folks who are ahead on this, uh, who are doing the ready mix, thinking about, oh, I, maybe I should look at this glass puzzle on products because it could help me a lot to have some of these options that could bring it down or blended cements, but it's just making them a lot more open um, to thinking about other things. And it's gonna set the stage for our state to create procurement guidelines as well. Next slide. And then this uh, embodied carbon challenge 
is purely sort of educational in nature. And uh, it, it comes out of a fact that uh, Mass CEC doesn't have a lot of money and we are just trying to do anything to try and attract attention to uh, the fact that there's a lot of high impact, low cost things that can be done. Uh, next slide. And so um, there's basically 11 prizes and this is aimed at larger buildings of over 20,000 square feet or not where you're starting to get into your structural steel and a lot of concrete. Um, 30,000, uh, let's see. Nine of them are $30,000 prizes and two are $50,000 grand prizes. Two of the grand prizes, one will be for new construction and one will be for a major renovation project. Um, and the reason we have so many of them is that we really want people who haven't been doing life cycle analysis and thinking about this to get in, get educated, get working on this and coming up with new ideas. And so the hope is, is if they teach themselves how to do this and put together a good application, they have a pretty good shot at getting at least the 30,000 to pay for their time. Um, at the same time, we are holding a ton of educational um, resources. So those of you interested in this kind of thing, I think the um, Built Environment Plus is, uh, we held a one on tricks and tips related to free design tools. So a lot of the things like where and when is Kaleidoscope helpful for you? And how would you use it? When would you think about a structural engineer using the SE uh, 2050 uh, tool that they have for looking at, at outputs? Um, so that's, a, that's one of my favorite ones that they put on, but you should take a look at all the different educational stuff. It's all recorded and available for people. And then anybody who wants to participate in the um, competition, it, we are paying for the paid tools that are used for life cycle analysis. So one click or tally are the two most used ones. Um, companies can sign up and get a free year of using those for free and to try them out. And there's lots of trainings associated with those as well. So our goal here is in March of next year to have a, a bunch of great applications that tease out a lot of fantastic ideas, some that were talked about in the materials section, uh, some that are design related, some that might be mass tim timber related, new buildings, renovation projects, and uh, hopefully there'll, there'll be a lot of great things to bring to your symposium next year. So, uh, Thanks so much for having me. And it's just so wonderful to hear so many people's great ideas at this symposium. Uh, Bev, thank you so much. Uh, we want to segue quickly into a, a form of a panel discussion. This the space, Bev, you're, you, you may have seen it, I guess, or maybe not, but it's like a panel that's designed for people who absolutely don't like each other and want to sit as far away as possible. You know, uh, two chairs on, I, I would move this lectern, but we probably wouldn't come back to Parsons because I would have broken some serious rule of cabling and the such to move this out of the way. But do, do you want to, everybody want to come up and take these chairs and maybe check the mics and see if, uh, I think they, they will. Yeah, you have to turn it on. You have to adjust it. Uh, we want to make sure you're you're still with us here. Yep. Hello. Hello. Okay. I'm here. Hey. I have to sit on the far side. Hey. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, just we're going to uh, one quick question, which I've never uh, really asked this one before. But do any of the panelists have questions for other panelists? Like you're always asked, you know, something specifically. But have you been sitting here listening and wondering that you wanted to ask something of somebody here? Well, that's putting us on the spot. Gina and I talk regularly. Um, <laughs> So I don't think I have any questions for Gina McHale. I probably have a lot to ask you, but they're going to be really deep money questions. Like, when are you going to launch a program like Bev's? Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering that too. I feel like I, I, I'm like Bev. When can we talk more? Uh, <laughs> also, to see what you know, what you've been able to do in Mass, um, even you know, in, in the absence of, of sort of um, 
formal um, policy directive. So that's really exciting. And, and I'll, I'll just say that in New York, um, we're, we um, are standing up an embodied carbon working group among state agency staff with the goal of really educating them and, and trying to turn them into evangelists for um, identifying reduction opportunities at their agencies. Um, and so I, I'm really looking forward to seeing what that cohort will produce. And um, Bev, it would be great to have you to have you speak to them. <laughs> of course. Maybe we just have comments. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm going to take you up on it, Buck, and and maybe this is for Beverly and Mikhail, and you can say I'm going to have to get back to you, and we'll work together in the future. But I know from a local on 97 perspective, we have an enormous amount of alteration that needs to happen to existing buildings, and we're not talking about those pervasive materials that have really dominated so far. I mean, we might see a uh, large number of owners that have to replace windows, which, you know, they they don't last forever. Somehow they think, that, you know, a lot of owners think, what do you mean? I have to replace my windows someday. Um, but we'll be talking more about maybe some over cladding and facade materials. And we may be talking about a lot of mechanical systems that eventually would have been replaced anyway. Uh, and we're trying to make local on 97, much friendlier to the capital cycles and the planning that owners have done so that they can do things as the time comes. But we, I haven't seen a lot of great information about embodied carbon of those types of systems and how are we going to try and reduce the amount of embodied carbon in particular in mechanical systems. I think, you know, this is maybe a good opportunity to, to step back a little bit on embodied carbon. So embodied carbon in my mind is really a new construction thing, right? So it's like when you're going to buy something new, when you're going to do a, a renovation or, or build new, what are the options instead of going out and purchasing a new material? And so I think for the, the uh, like mechanical systems that are at the end of their useful life, they, the, the real question is like, what will they be replaced with? Um, and, you know, what are the options that are available? And it would be great, I think, to develop a resource around that. Um, but I, you know, I think that this is also one of the areas where we're looking at trade-offs, right, between continuing to use fossil resources um, versus having an opportunity to electrify and get efficiency improvements. Um, a lot of these older um, mechanical systems, I'm, I'm thinking like boilers, for instance, right, they are so, so carbon intensive that um, it, it like, you know, it hands down, it's the right thing to do to replace them immediately. Um, and it gets dicier, I think, when we're looking at um, envelope measures, um, just in, in terms of, you know, is that triple pane really worth it? Um, but I think for some of the mechanical systems, it's actually probably going to be a little bit of a no brainer where it's like, you just go electric and put the heat pumps in. Thank you. And can I ask one more question, Buck? I asked if everybody has heard of Local on 97, and thank goodness nobody shook their head no. How many of you are actively working on a retrofit of an existing building for Local on 97? No. That's not enough hands. <laughs> so, I, and I think that that's um, one of the things we need this, the architects, engineers, stakeholders around the city to help us find those owners and get them going um, because it's really important to get started now. I did, you did answer a question I was planning to ask you, Gina, or partially, but I'm so curious if you can tell when you're getting applications for work, uh, for filings, whether, is there something that's exterior wall related because it's the hardest thing to do with an existing building, particularly if they're occupied and it would end up being equivalent to an uh, incremental step-by-step -step retrofit? Like, do you see anything like that is happening yet? We have a question in DOB now. <laughs> so have any of you seen it? If you go in to file an application in DOB now for a new building, the system will ask, ask you, is, is this yeah. project related to, or for alterations, is this project related to compliance for local on 97? So we started collecting that data um, about a year or so ago. And um, we can look at the data and see, is this really a project, you know, that's for local on 97 compliance? And yet they're 
definitely some very large alteration projects happening that we can see in the system. And, and I'm really grateful for the uh, folks that take a little bit of time to give us really good information because of course you can put anything you want and it might not be useful to us, but it is helping us identify where our owner's making investments. And we're gonna track and see how that, that grows over the years. Thank you. They did exactly that, you know, uh, looking at a public housing and doing the exterior facade. And then they have this policy which called, you know, demolition is violence. But they also have a very extensive uh, data system to so the entire. Uh, so I would, I would uh, just uh, suggest that. Thank you. And their work about housing and rehabilitation of the exterior facade. Thank you. Uh uh, well, I'm I'm trying to establish a pr process here, but thank you. <laughs> uh, I love I love you though, Ed. Everything you were talking about. So that's. Uh, yeah, yeah. We we've got cards. We're we're trying to follow this file card process. You know, so I don't want to break break my my. It wasn't like my idea, but an idea in the first thirty seconds here of doing it. Uh, uh, are there any other comments on the from the panelists that they want to ask anybody else? Bev, do you have any anything you want to pipe in here on? Not to put you on the spot, but I just did. I'm waiting for your question about what we want to do ideally. Oh, I can. Uh, okay, I'll ask that one. Okay, <laughs> so this was a, a pre-established, you know, in one of our early earlier calls, you know, with this group. And so the idea is that if, if you could have one initiative that you could move forward where you were disconnected, not wearing the hat that you wear during the day, not constricted by money or time, what would you want to do, you know, in this arena? I can, I'm expecting Bev that you'll jump right in here now because yeah. is that soon you were anticipating? Yes, that was what I was anticipating. So um, New England HERS, all you guys know HERS Raiders, right? Um, has recently been integrating the BEAM tool th that Builders for Climate Action has with HERS rating software. And so there is this potential for HERS Raiders when they're, and let's just think for a minute, one to four family. So this is a little less metropolis-ish and more less the dense part of, of the state of New York or Massachusetts. Um, I would like to see us get at least a hundred using those, asking those extra questions uh, that will allow for when a HERS rating is done to also give a rough score for embodied carbon. And that would allow us to see the range on a per square foot for these different building types and um, potentially lead us in the direction to some kind of policy around getting, you know, making sure that things are getting rid of the worst quartile, for example, uh, the way that uh, Chris Magwood was doing in, in Canada. So I'd love to see Massachusetts do that and also New York do that. I'll go next. All right, thank you. I'd love to see that too. Um, so the thing that I'm really excited about on the embodied carbon front is material reuse centers. And we have a few in the state and it seems like we could have so many more. And material reuse centers are, are sort of a complex that typically involve a um, store where um, harvested materials are, are resold like um, doors, windows, um, siding, maybe, you know, cabinetry. Um, we, we have a uh, big reuse here in, in New York city. Um, there's finger lakes reuse up North. Um, also in Ithaca, um, a reuse center, the, the one that's sort of my favorite example though, is in the DC area. Um, and, uh, they they not only have a store, but they also offer, um, training programs for, um, folks who want to learn to do, um, 
like residential uh, plumbing, electrical, um, carpentry, and really develop skills so that they can um, do home retrofits. Um, and there are um, also uh, examples up um, in, in sort of the Northern Midwest of um, using those same centers to do training on weatherization um, and um, efficiency retrofits. But in many instances, and I think particularly here in, in New York, we have situations where um, in um, disadvantaged communities, environmental um, uh, injustice areas, there um, are there's just a lot of housing that can't take these retrofits, right? A lot of um, homes and businesses that really need basic work done in order to be able to um, be able to have a roof that has that can have a solar panel or um, be able to do a um, you know an electrification um, uh, retrofit or a lighting upgrade. And so that the opportunity to train local folks, I think is really important. And I've also been part of um, some fix it cafes um, in California where I'm from, where you go in and sort of, you know, bring in a thing like a, a lamp or like, you know, like some clothes that need to be sewn. Um, I did the sewing one since I sew, um, but I also brought a lamp in and had it fixed by this uh, retired electrician guy. And, and it was really amazing to see just how um, important um, it was at activating the community and, and um, providing a, a space for people to, to come and connect with each other. And like, yes, like the built environment is the thing that, you know, we all work in and, and that sort of like the, the, the quantitative metric, mm -hmm. but um, people are just so like enthusiastic about it and having a space where retirees can, you know, continue to like have skills and, and um, teach others. So I, I'm most excited about projects that have multiple benefits and that go beyond just the physical environment that really, you know, Im improve social well-being and combat isolation and loneliness. And so I, I feel like there's just a multitude of benefits that come from those reuse centers. And I'd, I'd love to see more of them um, funded in, in New York and, and adopted. And it seems like they also are pretty self-sustaining once they get started. Very good. Thank you. Um, the initiative that I've been thinking about for quite a while, ever since the, that embodied uh, carbon workshop is, I don't know how feasible it is, but the idea that the city would phase out one really bad material per year. And in my mind, right, stuff needs to be vetted, right? We can't just start specifying all these cool new materials on our project because they're they look green. And then we worry that they'll delaminate the next year. We have a whole slew of apartments that need new floors already and, and so on. But the idea of taking the approach of let's all go after one bad thing together, really figure it out and say, okay, at the end of 2024, the bad whatever is no longer allowed. And then focus year by year and really use group think and you know and get a lot of excitement around a big project and again that aligns with my idea that 10 years is what you need for anything good thank you gina i i have to figure out a creative way to answer this because i'm a you know regulator and i <laughs> i don't get to talk about my own hopes and dreams because then it gets misinterpreted as our next policy um <laughs> So I'm not setting policy up here, but I can tell you about some of the challenges that I think would make my job a little easier. It's all about me. I just want my job to be easier. Um, we have uh, a tremendous amount of work that needs to happen in the coming decades. And I know one of the things that is you know, a head scratcher for me, and I don't know, I, my department can't really tackle this. We're not equipped. It's not our expertise, but we have a lot of tradespeople that need to be educated about how important these changes are and how important it is that they stop doing things the way they've always done them. And, um, you know, I like had a person in my house to look at my water heater and I'm like, yeah, what about a heat pump water heater? And he's like, oh, what? Um, so we have an, an enormous amount of education to do for the trades. And I think we also have a lot of education to do for architects and engineers to get them excited about the kinds of projects that we really need um, their assistance with, uh, the really boring buildings that 
you know, need to be improved and it's not sexy, exciting work that's going to get published on the cover of Architect. Hopefully it will. I mean, we really need to get everybody excited about the opportunity we have to improve all of the buildings that we have to deal with today that we want to keep around and keep them productive and great places to live and work and, and study. So I, we have a huge amount of education to do. And um, I hope that we can find ways to, to make that happen in the next couple of years in a really efficient and effective way. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, yes, I'm gonna jump to a couple file cards here. Just, uh, I, I understand there's food and, and drink like that that way. Uh, oh, so. okay. And, and t-shirts. Shh, don't tell them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, here's a question. What steps are taking place to notify owners of three family buildings of their okay, local law 97? Okay, they're not they're not subjected to local law 97 unless they're very, very, very big apartments. Because there's a 25,000 square foot uh, minimum, but local law 154 obligations. Uh, we are working on outreach right now, and we are going to be putting that out uh, into the, the public realm soon. Uh, probably a, a document to inform architects and engineers, you know, like all the cold code and wonky language about the things you can't do and the things you can still do, and um, translating the language from the legislation into a little more user-friendly language. We do have just a one-page flyer, but I'm sure most owners don't go looking for that on our website. They, the ones that are aware of this are the ones that want to keep their gas stoves, and they think that we're coming for their gas stoves and existing buildings, which we're not. Um, so that there, there is a lot of education that we also need to do because most of the questions that we get about Local Law 154 are about existing buildings and about not about new construction, but this is a law that applies mm -hmm. mostly only to new construction. And if it's not wow. new construction, then it's a an alteration to an existing building with a new certificate of occupancy and um, existing elements that remain where you've increased the, the um, surface area of the floors by 110%. Um, we call that big all. <laughs> so if if you've increased the surface uh, floor area of the building, then you could trigger local law 154, but mostly new construction only. And and we are starting to put that outreach out there. We didn't want to put it out too soon because we didn't want everybody scrambling to try and get their project done and get their gas stoves and their gas boilers and their gas furnace and. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some of that happening at the end of December. We are going to see a huge influx of applications um, and hopefully they're complete, but if they're not, <laughs> they'll be subject to local law 154. All right. Thank you. Uh, question for HPD. Is there a penalty for developers who do not meet their sustainability objectives, i.e. healthy materials, low embodied carbon, et cetera, that help them win the RFP. For example, during the construction, they value engineer out good initiatives after already receiving project funding. This, this crosses beyond HPD, this kind of question. So I'm curious about the answer. Um, that's a really good question. Um, it's, the, the projects that we do, I, I we're the ones with the purse strings. Inevitably, there may be certain things along the way that do have to be scaled back, right? It's our money. We can't necessarily fund everything. We try to be really smart when we look at the applications and say, there's no way that you can possibly do the things that you think you are going to do, right? We're, we're generally pretty good at evaluating. If you come to me and say, we have this cool new mass timber building with all these innovations and heat recovery and CO2 hot water heaters and 20,000 other really great things. We're going to know that that's not going to meet the budget. Um, so yes, some things may fall out, but the really big priority items, right, are the ones we're focused on, right? And we don't score our RFPs like who's got the most stuff on the project. Never for that reason. 
we look for the key initiative or the key, you know, really big things we're trying to accomplish and make sure that those are held through the project. <laughs> but I'm sure there's some misses and I don't know, somebody obviously did it and is asking why they didn't get found out maybe. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna put this as the last question. Um, I'm not, it's just because uh, I think it's time. But... A, a huge aspect of energy savings is behavior shift and broader set points. Do any of your programs, and it's not referencing anybody specifically, engage building users? That would probably be me. Um, we've been doing a huge amount of work, especially around electrification, right? We have to set all of the rules and the policies to support electrification on our buildings, right? Like we all know there was virtually no controls on the old school systems. There will be with local law 97 and so on, but we're really, really sensitive to it with electrification. So we advise building owners who are doing centralized systems about, you know, sort of setting maximum minimum temperatures that make sense, leaving flexibility for certain populations educating residents, right? So we're doing a lot of that work. We're going to be piloting pretty soon like QR codes on equipment so that like users can just quickly figure out like, who do I call if this thing doesn't seem to be working or my heat pumps blowing cold air, which they do, we all know. Um, and all of those kind of engagement. When we are talking about tenant paid expenses, which is pretty new territory in New York City, affordable housing for heat, we do extensive outreach and education for any kind of project where the tenant is responsible for paying for the utilities. Same reason. We have uh, requirements about set points, dead bands, the whole shebang, so that nobody inadvertently, you know, turns on their equipment, leaves it on forever, and then is stuck with the bill. So we are doing a lot of that. We'll do outreach to shareholders and tenants and buildings that we're um, proposing electrification in. Does that answer the question? That's how we're trying to handle it. it sound, sounds good, sounds certainly. Uh, listen, uh, I wanna thank our, our, our panel. Bev, thanks a lot there for everything. I wanna thank the audience for everybody sticking around this long. Very uh, appreciative of, of your time here and participation.